for choosing to worship with us this morning. Those of you that are here, those of you that are going to be worshiping with us on YouTube, we are we're still recording our services and are recording it. It's been ready on Monday morning. Thank you, Bob, for all your hard work in that. I am still sending out the bulletins for those of you that are home. If you're not getting one via email, it means I do not have your email. So please call me at the church office and I will take care of that problem. I want to make sure if you want a bulletin at home that you are certainly getting one. No children's church again today. Keep your children with you and enjoy them. And now we're looking at possibly next Sunday starting children's church again. But stay tuned for more information on that. We're working on it. Youth group today, yes? Yes. Yes. Youth group today, that's a good thing. Bob Daly has an announcement he'd like to make. Good morning, church. Good to see you all here. So we want to uh, kickstart or... I had a clever way of saying it, uh, reboot life groups. How's that? Does that sound good? Uh, life group 2.0. Anyway, what we decided we're going to do is we have some more people inquiring about joining groups. We have some groups that are too big. We've got some hosting and facilitator uh, shortages. So what we're going to do is this coming Wednesday, 6.30, we're going to meet at, uh, at the campus right here, and we're going to have a... Uh, Bring your, if you want to bring your lawn chair or grab one of the chairs from the, from the uh, fellowship hall, bring a lawn chair, bring something for you and your family to eat if you'd like to do that. And we're just going to have some fellowship and food and, and keep, keep safe and distance and so on and so forth. Then we're going to come in for like a 20, 30 minute kind of message study slash thing. A, a Q&A by all means is encouraged. It's going to be kind of just where are we going from here with our life groups. And then we're going to break up in the existing life groups. There'll be discussion on, uh, you know, who may want to host in the future to keep the sizes down and so on and so forth. And uh, also then for anybody who's curious about life groups, please join us. And you can meet the different life groups. We've got three right now. There should be four with the amount of people we have coming to one of them, which the, one of them gets 18 to 20 at a, at a time, and that needs to split. So we need more hosts and more facilitators. So that's the plan. It should be about a two-hour uh, adventure, 6.30 to 8.30. Or did I decide 6 o'clock? What did I decide? What, I, what was my final decision, Jackie? Was it 6? I think we'll do it a little earlier. I, big, big change, slash that, edit that. 
Watch clearly, the mouth makes a sentence. We're starting at six, <laughs> not 6.30. Big corporate decision change there. I think I'm taking myself out to dinner and celebrate that decision. Anyway, nonetheless, six o'clock on Wednesday, I think it's gonna work better. Six o'clock to roughly eight. Any questions? Cool, hope to see you all there. Thank you. The, the opening song that we did today comes almost directly from Psalms 84. If you'd like to turn there, I'm going to be reading some passages from Psalms 84. Starting with verse 1. Give you, I guess some people are turning. I'll give you a quick minute. Okay. Psalm 84, 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. The writer of this psalm is apparently in exile in his journey to get back to the temple of the Lord. That's what he's talking about, the courts of the temple of the Lord. The writer obviously felt closer to the Lord in the temple. Beginning again with verse 8. Hear my prayer, O God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. A doorkeeper is like a security guard. It's considered a really humble Position. A guard was on the outside, wasn't allowed in. He could look in, but he was not allowed inside the temple. So the psalmist is saying it's better even to be outside looking in where the Lord is than to live elsewhere for a thousand years away from the Lord. That's what he's saying. Continuing in verses 11 to 12. For the Lord... God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, how wonderful it is to be in your presence. How wonderful it is to be able to worship you as a body of believers. Better is one day in your presence than a thousand elsewhere. The psalmist looked forward to worshiping you in the temple. We as believers look forward to one day worshiping you face to face when you usher in your new heaven and your new earth. Be with us, O Lord, and bless this time of worship. May everyone present come away renewed, and refreshed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now Carol's going to come up. So good morning. Um, I do have some mission news. Um, and when I did the prayer requests and stuff for the newsletter, I hadn't received this from uh, Macedonia. And so there were some things in it that I wanted to share with you today. So um, also it says in the bulletin, today is uh, designated as the International Day of Prayer for the Unreached. Um, and I'm not sure if some of you might have gotten the information from ANM, which is the Macedonian's um, uh, umbrella uh, organization. Uh, it uh, stands for Advancing Native Missions, and they have missionaries um, all over the world, uh, and they're usually indigenous uh, missionaries, which are which means people who were born and raised in that country and have come to faith in Christ, and now are reaching the unreached in their local areas. So we support uh, Mirce and his wife Nada and the missions to the Balkans in Macedonia. They are located in Skopje, which is the capital city of Macedonia. Um, Mirce says, thank you for your prayers and support. He is always thanking us and, and appreciates everything that, uh, that we do for them. And he uh, said that in January, this was ex uh, exceptional news, that they uh, officially started their first Albanian evangelical church um, and it was, it's among the Albanians of Macedonia, which is mostly that population are Muslims. And that's why it is a pretty huge thing because it's the first church amongst Muslims in Albania. Um, and then um, the three, there were three men who uh, were working towards 
reaching the unreached in this area. And those three men, one was from, uh, he is Albanian, one is Romanian, and the other one is from California here in the United States. And they were doing separate ministry, okay, uh, on their own. And then they came together, they decided to collaborate together, and that's how the church began, is through those efforts, the Lord began that church there. So um, we're very excited that, that that church is ongoing, and Muslims in a lot of the Balkan areas are coming to faith in Christ. Uh, a sad thing that happened was um, their Christmas day is actually January 7th, which I've mentioned before, because they are part of the Julian calendar and the Greek Orthodox. So they celebrate Christmas on that day. And the church in Chiflik was attacked and uh, damage was done. There was some broken windows and burning and things like that. Um, they weren't meeting at that time, but, <clears throat> but the church uh, did, um, receive um, this, this, these problems, and the structure does remain sound, he said, so that is a good thing. And the other sad thing is that this church has been attacked seven times in the last two years. Mm. So um, sometimes when I put in prayer requests and things for different, different things, you know, it, it gives us opportunity to pray. They are grateful that the Lord protected the rest of the building and that there were no people there. Um, but it is still disturbing and, and discouraging to them. So we pray that uh, the pastor and his wife, they are very brave because they want to continue the church even amongst uh, some of the um, uh, problems that they have had. And then another new thing, I didn't know anything about this until I got this uh, letter, but <clears throat> Mirce's uh, partner, Marino is his name, um, and he has been working towards being a part of the European Union Parliament over there. And just recently, he says, I was blessed beyond measure. He has been now accredited to be a member of, you know, in the audience of the Parliament. Um, it's great to have a Christian sitting in amongst government. Um, and. He says, I don't have to beg anyone to be able to be admitted anymore. And God has provided him a place to stay uh, in Brussels with a family uh, so that he's nearby the parliament. So uh, that, that's pretty exciting. And um, so I just wanted to give you those updates. And so let's just pray uh, for what's going on over in Macedonia and the Balkans. Lord God, you are great and mighty and you, there are no borders for you. We thank you that you are working so so diligently through the people in Macedonia and the Balkans and other places in the world, Lord God. We lift up their ministry. They're, they have planted so many churches over there, Lord. I don't even know what the number is now. And you are reaching many, many souls for your kingdom. So we do lift up Marino to you, Lord, as he uh, gets to be a part of uh, what's going on in Parliament and then um, we pray for how he can be effective there. Thank you for the church, Lord, in Chiflik, and we do pray for your protection for the believers there and the pastor and his wife. You are a great God, and we give you praise and honor this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> okay. So when you get older and you forget stuff... <laughs> There's always this, this balance of weighing, is the embarrassment <laughs> worth the cost versus the information. Should I just leave the information out and then not suffer the embarrassment or should I just go for it and just be embarrassed? So this is it. Wednesday, dress accordingly because we're gonna be inside and outside for the social distancing uh, uh, way, thing, whatever. That was it. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> If you guys would stand, we'll continue with worship.
song says, you are good when nothing is good in me, and I'm running to your arms. And um, as these times that we're in, we're running to his arms. A lot of us are already, and we can remember to do that when times get good. <coughs>
to die on a tree suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he the hand that healed nations stretched out One day he's coming, oh glorious day. The Apostle Paul talks about this glorious day in the book of Titus, Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in his present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Paul must have been really excited when he wrote this because verses 12 through 14 are all one sentence. He doesn't stop. <laughs> it just keeps going with his praises. And we should be excited too. We all should be excited because the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior is coming soon. 
Let us pray together. We'll be praying for our offering at this time. Heavenly Father, as we sang in the song, O glorious day, it will indeed be a glorious day when our Lord and Savior returns. Help us, O Lord, to follow the instructions written to Titus. Help us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives until the day of our Lord's glorious appearing. It is our privilege to praise you, O Lord, with our tithes and our offerings. We give you thanks for every gift we have received and ask that you bless the gifts and bless the givers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Hopefully you have your Bibles. I know that uh, like what we've been doing is putting the green sheet out there. If you don't have it, I understand. There's a... Uh, What's that? Oh, I thought somebody was talking. <laughs> All right, if you open your Bibles to the book of Galatians, we're going to be jumping into this book. And uh, one of the things I was thinking about as we finished up Lamentations last week and looking at uh, really the, for lack of a better term, looking at the signs of the times. As we look around, it's interesting that um, certainly in my young life, 45 years old, seeing, um, especially as a Christian for 25, 28 years, uh, seeing the way things are shifting in our culture, and uh, relatively unprecedented, I wasn't alive during really any of the other wars or other sort of uh, protests, or you think about the civil rights movement and other things, that here we are watching a lot of things unfold. How long will it last? We don't know. Um, but when we think about, I was just thinking about going back into the New Testament, I like to go back and forth, is we are entering into, um, I think, um, everything is becoming more extreme. That's like really what I'm after, is you take a theme or you take a topic and it's becoming more polarized, right? Our culture is becoming more polarized. And um, so for some reason, uh, I mean, for some good reasons and also for some bad reasons, but it's interesting that... We were watching, um, Angela and I were watching something yesterday, and the person was, was giving this, um, I don't know, comment about all the things that were going on, and it was, re re the person was relatively talking about uh, hate, 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 and yet they turned around and claimed how tolerant they were. And I thought, well, that's interesting that uh, tolerance seems to be the, the name of the game, um, except if you disagree with them. You know, that's kind of the, the way it goes. And interestingly, as we, as we live the next however many years it is, I thought, I hate to say it this way, but the Bible, specifically the gospel, when the gospel's presented, think about it this way. Here we are as Christians. We live in this world, we live in the American culture, and when we come into the, onto the scene, or when we come into the arena of ideas, think of about that way, right? You have the arena of ideas out there. You have people making comments, we're talking to people, we're living in the world, and so you have, of course, the media, you have conversations, you have pundits, you have all of this, and here we are, and we come in, and we drop the bomb of the gospel. Now, why is it a bomb? It's exclusive. And so what, what I was thinking about was that we, we need to continue to be loving and kind and gracious. But it's fascinating to me that the, the, the risk for us as believers is from the world is, is the challenge and the temptation to compromise. And, and what I want us to do is I think about uh, Carol's update, which is so important because here are brothers and sisters around the world that are suffering, that are being persecuted. For what? The bomb. The exclusivity of the gospel, the ways in which the gospel stands in contrast, in, and not only in the culture, but 
When Paul comes along, I, I want to do a little history here. I have a map for us as we get into the, to the, the book of Galatians. That's a little tough to see, I imagine. But on the bottom right is Syria. We're looking at the northeastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. And modern-day Turkey, pretty big. And in the south there, the little red lines is what you see Paul's first missionary, first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13. Where he goes, he gets, he gets saved in Acts chapter 9, and you see him disappear for a few years, really getting into the Old Testament, getting confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, Saul was a persecutor of the church, and his, his world was rocked by Jesus showing up to him personally. Well, then after that, he decides to go. God calls him on a missionary journey. And they go and, and wander around the southern part of, of Turkey, which is considered Galatia. Okay? Galatia is like a region. It's not just one area. It would be like saying the southwest or something. So I want us to think about the chronology here that Paul is going out now to preach this good news. But he comes from a Pharisaical background, right? We know that he was uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he was committed to his cause. And then Jesus showed up and let him understand the glory of the gospel. And so coming out of Judaism, you've got to remember that, Judaism became bloated, it became institutionalized so that when Jesus shows up on the scene, he's bringing this, this good news of his own death uh, and his own resurrection and what it would do in bringing forth and solving the stain of sin and bondage. And then Paul, the, the, the early church goes out and, and I guess what I'm saying is we have to remember that you know we get... We get this book, we have it in one, one spot. You could sit there and read the book of Acts in 30 minutes. And uh, it's, you know, 28 chapters, covers 30 plus years. And so we get this snapshot of being, of receiving the book at, at one, one drop and go, oh yeah, look at this, boom, 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 all this happened. But in reality, we miss putting ourselves into the lives of the New Testament church. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, Peter, when he preaches his first gospel, in Act, the gospel in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, which is, is today actually, and um, the gospel stays in Jerusalem and Judea for several years. And, and, and the gospel is going out to all these Jewish people. And then it's not until Acts chapter 8 when it goes to the Samaritans. And you go, oh, okay. But that was several years later. So here you have the gospel staying in this, in this little um, you know, microcosm of, of belief. And then we see it go in Acts chapter 10 to Cornelius. And then it goes out and then Paul comes along and you get saved. But you, by the time the gospel goes here, you probably have five to ten years later. And it's fascinating. So now Paul is going out preaching the gospel to these Gentiles, these non-Jewish people. Now here's the question, okay? We have the Old Testament. We, there's a lot of laws in the Old Testament. The question, all of us at one time or another, is, well, what's my relationship to the Old Testament? Some teachers today, you know, um, are talking about, we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. And I go, whoa, I mean, my master's degree in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. That's why I like to go back and forth. But what we do recognize is that we don't follow the Mosaic laws. It's not required. And that was the question. Paul goes out, preaches these Gentiles. He comes back to Jerusalem. Come to find out some, some people from Jerusalem had gone and followed in his footsteps behind him and said, Oh, you Gentiles, you need to... Yeah, Jesus is great. His death on the cross is great. But you need to add something. You can't be saved or stay saved unless you do A, B, C, and D, follow the Old Testament, follow all the feasts, get circumcised, blah, blah, blah. And Paul's like, no way. And when you come to the book of Acts in chapter 15, you have the first council. All, everybody's getting together and they go, hey, Paul, tell us what happened. Well, Paul says, man, I went up to this area. I preached the gospel. Man, that person's getting saved and there was a revival in the land. 
And they're going, wow, all these Gentiles? So then the question comes up, the Pharisees there, who were believers, who were stuck in their old system, said, we need to require them to follow the Old Testament laws. That means no bacon, no shrimp, no mixed clothing, going to church on Saturday, which was the Sabbath, all, circumcision, all these requirements. And then there's a, all this discussion that goes on. And this is kind of the background. I've given it on the sheet. You have these background here where finally Peter gets up and he says, Hey, why do you guys, to the Pharisees, why would you want to put on these Gentiles the law? This yoke, this heaviness, which we ourselves couldn't handle. He said, Jesus didn't come to die for us so that we could believe in him and then add the law in order to keep ourselves saved. What you have here is ultimately Paul then turns around and writes this book to that church and says, how is it that you've so soon abandoned the gospel of freedom which I gave you? And so what you have here, some of the themes when you think about Galatians is this. Here's, here, if you don't remember anything else, this is what it is. Jesus plus nothing. That's, that's the substance of the gospel. And what you have later, you know, some of you who are really into New Testament studies or other things, you'll see um, something about 25, 30 years ago called this new perspective of Paul, NPP. I won't get into all of it, but it's what they tried to say is, no, no, no. Judaism wasn't teaching salvation by works. Because, right, you have faith. Are we saved by faith or are we saved by what we do? Well, we know we're saved by faith. And so people say, well, oh, yeah, yeah. Paul is, is arguing against these people, the religious Jews that were saying they're saved by works. And you go, well, that's not really what they taught. But it's interesting to me that when you get into it, Here's what they say. You are saved by grace and faith, but you stay saved by your works. Is that, is that really how it goes? Now here's the question for us. We think about the, the Mosaic law, 613 laws, and, and what you have here is as it develops here into modern day situations is um, you have some that are proposing that you have to follow all the feasts in order to make God happy with you. Now, are the, like today, the day of Pentecost. We could come, we could celebrate the day of Pentecost. It's a great Acts chapter 2. It's an anniversary of when the church began. It's a fulfillment. We see in the Old Testament the, these feasts that come along and they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we go, awesome. All of those things point to Jesus. They point to all the, the, the beauty of what God was trying to get the Jewish people to understand. However, if we don't celebrate them, or if you ate bacon today, is God displeased with you? You go, oh, well, I mean, it is part of the old covenant law. And what, or if you're not circumcised, these, these are the things that you're going to see. And what Paul begins to say is, no, no, no. I'm worried for you. Galatians, I came and preached to you as Gentiles this gospel of freedom. And yet you've so soon departed from that. Now, we're going to see some things here today. And so let's read Galatians chapter one. I'll just read you a few verses and then we'll we'll jump into this. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Again, this is, there's multiple churches here. It's an area. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I'm going to read the rest just, just so we can see the, the flavor here. Just, we'll go through verse 10. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ 
to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For, I, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So what I want to do is, is just focus on the first five verses here. And we're going to see three things today because we're going to see that here we are, again, with this book, with this gospel, that we go out and I think about how much we are going to continually be ostracized. We don't belong in a world of pluralism. Now, what we're seeing, especially now with all of the, these riots and these other things and these protests and of violence, and we look and we go, did Jesus call us to go out and to convert people by force? You don't find that in the New Testament. Well, it's interesting, even God, when he sends us out, we're to go out there and to preach the gospel and to proclaim the good news and throw it out there in the midst, I'll say it this way, we're to go out and present our message, which is God's message, in the arena of ideas. We're not out there to force people. We're not out there to beat people up. We're not out there to be violent. We're actually to go out there and in many ways, allow ourselves to be abused, to allow ourselves to be persecuted. We're, we're to allow ourselves to be, to be mocked because Jesus did that. And the whole book of 1 Peter is, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, then you got great reward in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 5, right? If people persecute you because of me and, and they abuse you, again, you're great is your reward in heaven. We're not to return evil for evil. So as we get out in the world, we are called to not compromise on one thing, and that's the gospel. So when people come and say, I remember one time a family member said to me, do you really believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and every other religion in the world, those people are going to go to hell? Do you really believe that? And I remember going, well, this is kind of awkward. <laughs> Because, you know, it's one of those questions where it's kind of like, when did you stop beating your wife kind of th question. It, it's, it, was, it, was, it was presented in such a way that the only really thing I could say if I didn't want to look like a complete idiot or fool or a bigot or, you know, whatever intolerant person was, no, I certainly wouldn't believe something as horrible as that. And I, I thought, okay, Mondo, what are you going to say? Because I was kind of put on the spot. And this is where all the scriptures come to your mind. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. And it's like, oh, oh. so, you know, who, who do I fear? Do I fear that or do I fear being put on the spot? And, and what we see in our culture is, yes, we're getting marginalized more and more and more. But as we continue to see this, it's going to be increasing. And I, I, what I see God doing, especially for Amer American Christianity is I see him coming along and gently, lovingly equipping us. Especially as we're seeing, you know, you know here we are um, gathering together. Um, how long will it last? Right? What if another wave comes? Things going to get closed again? Are we going to go back to not? Are we going to go back to the video? You know, we, all, we have to decide all these things. But if it continues to go, we might have to make a decision to stand for our freedom of association, you know, freedom of worship. And I picture God saying, okay, church, are you American church? Are you strong? Are you prepared? Are you um, committed enough to do what your brothers and sisters are already doing around the world? And I think, hmm, I got to, you know, I'm... You know, if I'm a rule follower, I got to ask myself, well, I don't want to be outside. And, you know, what, what if there's protests against us? Those are the kind of things that God's, 
I think he's beginning to shape us and to, 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 to equip us to ask, ask this question. So anyway, going back to my relative, I said, well, paused. <laughs> I go, I can understand where you're coming from. The idea that the Bible, that, that Jesus Christ and faith and trust in him is exclusive and eliminates all other religions of the world absolutely sounds extremely narrow. I totally agree with that. It sounds arrogant, it sounds intolerant, it sounds condemning, it sounds judgmental. Yep, I agree with all that. But this is what I'll tell you. It's not my message. It's God's message. So if people, this is what I said, is, is if people want to look at me for believing that, this is what I'll tell you. I am a sissy. Don't shoot the messenger. If people have a problem with that, they need to take it up with the God of the universe, the creator who, who, who can decide what is right or wrong. And he said, Jesus said very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So people, who am I? People can be upset with me, but do I believe that message? Yeah, I do. But it's not mine. And here we are, right here, this first thing we're going to see, the title of the message is The Absolute Authority of God's Message of Good News. And notice the first thing, the authority of the gospel is rooted in God's messenger and God's message, but also in God's motive. God's messenger, Paul, was called to be an apostle. Now you think about that. Why do we believe this? Well, we come and we recognize that you know, we look at scripture and we say, hmm, um, God came down, Jesus came down, appears to Paul himself and, you know, and confronts him, blinds him for three days. And Saul at the time, Acts 9, says, well, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, the one whom you've been persecuting. And it's fascinating that, that Jesus comes down, takes this Pharisee and corrects him. He was very committed, right? Committed enough to persecute the church and to, and to allow people and to arrest people and all these other things. He thought he was doing God's business. And well, then Jesus shows up and says, Paul, the, the, Saul, the ones who you are persecuting, it's me. That's how Jesus and us, we're his body. We're one. So as the church was being persecuted, Jesus says, it was me, Saul. But calls him to be an apostle. Now, it's interesting that, here's the question, and, and as we get out in our culture, even the Christian culture now, how many of you legitimately have met somebody or been involved in a church or whatever where they have apostles today? Mm -hmm. I remember when I was in Illinois, uh, I, I, we were on the suburbs way out, and there was a lot of churches, of course, in Chicago. And... Uh, this guy comes out and he comes out to meet me and his name was Apostle Tom and he would sign his, his emails and I was like, all right. <laughs> so Apostle Tom, tell me about yourself. He goes, well, we're, we got this new work of God. You know, God is doing this amazing thing in Chicago and God has called us to establish Zion in Chicago. I go, okay. And he had like a 10 year plan. You know, it's been 15 years now. And very little of it has been realized. But, because I, I still get the emails. But anyways, when he came, what he was saying was, I'm not trying to mock him, except to say, what he was proclaiming was, I have what? Authority. God is speaking to me. This special, unique revelation. And, and now you have this, the New Apostolic Reformation. You have all these people that are coming along saying that they're taking on this title of apostle. Apostle just means sent. It, it's, it's a verb, actually. I mean, it can be used as a noun. It means sent one. And it's interesting. I put on your sheet there, Acts 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Corinthians 12, these passages where, biblically speaking, like you throw in there Acts chapter 1 as well, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
You have to have seen him. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 9. He's defending his apostleship to these Corinthians that were up there. And he says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? Jesus appeared to, to, to Saul. And so, as I was listening to Apostle Tom, I was just being kind. But what I wanted to say was, well, when did Jesus appear to you? Because unless he appeared to you, you don't qualify. And it's interesting that if you look at many of the writings, whether it's Peter, generally it's Peter and Paul. They, they wrote their books. But they'll say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I was sent, that's what the word means, by Jesus Christ himself. And so when I'm writing to you, Corinthians or Galatians, etc., I'm writing to you with authority. I'm coming to you as the, as one of the messengers, which there were very few, of God himself. Now, I come to you, Mondo, come to you today with no authority except to read the authoritative word. I'm not an apostle of Jesus Christ. But when we come and we look at what Paul was talking about with the church, they had departed from his authoritative message, which was Jesus and plus nothing. And so it's fascinating to me. I, I did what I put on here. 2 Corinthians 8.23 which most of your versions will say messengers of the church. But the Greek word is apostle. What you do have is apostles of the churches. So for example, I know this church has been used by God to send missionaries out, right? Bring them up, you lay hands on them, you identify with them, you say, we stand with you, we're going to stand with you with prayer, with support, with money, you know, with coming back and, and, and resources, etc. There is such thing as an apostle of the church. That's what the, that passage says. But they don't go out with their own inherent authority. They're going out with the church's authority saying, we stand behind you. They're not going out there writing new scripture. But what you have today is this new apostolic reformation or other things. I mean, this guy in Chicago wasn't part of that. But he was coming and saying, the Lord spoke to me. And we're supposed to go, oh, he did. What did he say? Well, there's this special thing that God is doing. He's bringing Zion down to earth. And we're looking for partner churches who could be these, these instruments of God bringing the kingdom. And, and I was like, dude, I can't join you, man. I don't follow. I, I, first of all, I, I might appreciate that you're a brother in Christ, but I don't accept your authority. Because naturally, well, what happens next? Well, God has spoken to us this vision and he wants these churches to support it. Now granted, it's great what they're doing. They're doing a variety of things. But what the subtle thing is, we come today and we, when, we, when we're confronted with the world, we come and we say, world, we don't care what you say. We don't care how much you don't like us. This is the authority. This is the authoritative message. It is worth dying for. It's worth being persecuted for. It's worth being afflicted. It's worth being marginalized. And again, brothers and sisters around the world are, are, are being persecuted and, and destroyed and attacked all the time. God's messenger was given a supernatural commission. And this is where he, he says, I'm an apostle, not for men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And here he's talking to the Galatians and he's writing them and saying, don't you see, I know you guys, these Judaizers come along and I know you guys are questioning my authority, but what I'm telling you is I didn't get my message from Peter. I didn't get it from John and not that that would be necessarily bad because we do if we're reading the, the book of Peter or whatever. 
but they were questioning Saul, Paul, because he, was, he had gotten saved later. He goes, Jesus Christ himself showed up to me, the one who was raised from the dead. I've been given a supernatural commission by Jesus himself. Do any of those other guys that are coming in and, and bringing you this false doctrine, do they have that? And so what you see, this is the only place in all of Paul's letters where he starts out right in the beginning defending his apostleship. I'll read you John 13. Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one that I send, that's the word apostle, Whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So you have God the Father sending Jesus, Jesus sending his, his group of apostles with their message. And we have other places where now here we are as messengers of the churches. We could say, certainly say that. We come in the message and we say, we drop the bomb of ex exclusivity right there and say, Yes, Jesus said if it's, it, his gospel is the only way. There's nothing else. Well, that seems very narrow. Yeah, Jesus said that in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Take the narrow gate, right? The narrow road that leads to life. And that road is difficult. So here we are. When we think about where we're going in our trajectory as American Christians. Yeah, we have freedoms. How long? I don't know. Hopefully another generation, right? And we keep holding on to that. But what I, the question for us and what I see God doing is how committed are we to, uh, to stand true? God's messenger was given authority to all the churches. So as we, as we come here going deeper, our commission and authority to proclaim the gospel is absolute. We don't apologize to anybody. Now it's interesting to me let me read you another passage. This is where we have, uh, oftentimes we have Sunday school Jesus, which I mean is Jesus goes around patting the little kids on the cheek. He goes and just sharing the love of God for God so loved the world. And those are all great things. Oftentimes what we leave out is Jesus going into the temple, throwing all the tables over with whips and whipping people. We go, how come I never heard about that, Jesus? That guy's pretty intense. That guy's pretty serious. He seems passionate about God's holiness. He, listen to what he says here. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. Matthew 10, 34. Now, if I just quoted that to you, do not, who said this in the Bible? Do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. How many of us would say, well, that sounds like Jesus? Well, because we know, right? But isn't Jesus the Prince of Peace? But he comes and notice what he says. I'm not taking this out of context. Do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword or division. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be members of his own household he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me he who has found his life shall lose it and he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, this is intense. This is what they call the hard saying. This is what the people of Macedonia are living. This is what really in the beginning of the, uh, when you read the book of Acts and, and, and history, you still see this in Jewish thinking today. If a Jewish person comes to faith, oftentimes the parents will say they're dead. You see this in Muslim situations. What Jesus is talking about is not that we're supposed to go out there and beat people with their swords. That's not what he's saying. That would be misapplication. But Jesus is saying, I came and my message of the exclusivity of the gospel, that Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. That is going to cause trouble. 
It's going to cause division. I remember when I first began coming to this realization, you know, grew up Catholic, went to Catholic grade school up through eighth grade, but my parents were very nominal. It's not like they were these devout Catholics, okay? They still, they don't go to church at all. But when I came and presented, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus now, they were completely offended. I was like, well, I'm the only one that respects you of five kids. Do you think that this was a good thing? My dad said, I'm going to tell you something. You have a church. If you want to go to church, you go to the Catholic church. And if you don't, then you're out of this house. Well, that sounds like Matthew 10, 34. And I remember going, I, I was starting to read the Bible and I came across, I was like, oh, wow, this is so true. This is exactly what's happening. And then my neighbor who was my godfather, you know, when you're a Catholic, you go do communion, you're second grade, you carry your little thing, you know, and he was my godfather. Well, he, I remember pulling up one day and he came out and he said, I want to talk to you. And I go, yeah, what's up? You know, I'm 18. I've heard you left the faith. I go, no, actually I have found faith. He goes, I'm not, don't be sarcastic with me. And I'm like, I really, I'm not. He goes, let me tell you something. You continue to go down this road, you're going to be outside. You're going to be in hell. And I was like, you know, again, I wasn't religious at all. But it was interesting how zealous either my dad or this other guy were for religion in that sense. They weren't happy. Oh, you follow Jesus? You have a relationship with Jesus now? You've repented of your old life? And now you're getting serious about God? High five. Jesus says this in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's interesting to me that as I began to, I wasn't even a real preachy, but my friends would say, hey, Mondo, we're going party. And I go, oh, I don't really do that anymore. What do you mean? What are you, what are you saying? I go, I just said, I just don't do that anymore. Are you saying you're better than us? I never even said anything like that. I never once condemned anybody or judged them or said, you need to repent. It was simply the fact that I began to disassociate with that old lifestyle that they began the name calling. Oh, you're one of those Bible thumper now, huh? Oh, you're one of those holy rollers. Better, holier than thou. I go, and I remember, again, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. And I've been reading the Bible and getting freaked out. And I said, hey, look, I'm just a messenger here. I didn't create this. This existed before me. But it was amazing how, you, some of you probably would share this. How many times have we seen where somebody, I know in my life, you become a Christian and then all your friends disappear? They have no desire and then it becomes antagonistic then it becomes mocking and sometimes it comes out to full hatred Jesus says this remember the word that I said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you if they kept my word they will also keep yours but all these things they will do to you on account of my name because you do because they do not know him who sent me if I had not come and spoke to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. And there's no doubt, let's, let's be honest, when Christianity in its biblical form is thrown out in the midst of, of the arena of ideas, it is hated. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, when Samaritan's Purse went out there to risk their own lives to set up a, um, a medical center in Central Park. They weren't even preaching the gospel. They were just there to help. And the hatred and the venom 
that was spit at these guys. There were people out there with signs, and you're like, <laughs> it was ironic. We, New York City has no room for hate. That was a sign. And the people were in there sacrificing their own health to help others, while these people were outside denouncing and doing their own hating. But we're not surprised. The authority of the gospel is rooted in God's message. God's message is Jesus' sufficiency, sufficiency to rescue us from sin and the age. Notice what he says in verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us or deliver us from the present evil age. When we come, we don't come with a, a self-help message, right? It's interesting to me that you see some of these big churches and, and um, in my conversations with people, I say, you know, I would love to be a pastor at a mega church, okay? Let's say it's got 5,000. I would love to go in there and to see how long it took for it to go from 5,000 to 500 under my teaching. <laughs> I would love the experiment. Because when you look out, and I'm not saying that all mega churches are bad, because that's not true, but what you do see is how often Matthew 10:34 is never read. I did not come to bring peace, but division. And I think, man, this would be fun to go in here and just say, okay, how many of us are truly committed to the gospel in the sense of, of, the, of the hard sayings of Jesus? Or is it only God loves you, has a plan for your life, He wants to make you wealthy, He wants to make the best you of you? You know, part of sharing the message is repentance. And it's about talking about sin. And it's about changing our ways and growing. And none of us are perfect. We know that as Christians, in fact, as Christians, we should know how imperfect we really are. Because we're brought in on the other side and we see the grandeur of God's holiness and righteousness. And we come and we go, man, I have a long way to go. Because even if I start doing good, what happens? I become proud. And then I go, oh, pride is, has a thousand different faces. And the more spiritual you are, even as God cleans us up, the more we recognize how much we fall short. And what, what, what's going on in the book of Galatians, and we're going to see this more and more, is that... Here, here's Galatians 3.1. Foolish Galatians. Did you think, I'm paraphrasing, that since you started by the Spirit, that you're going to be perfected in the flesh... Like, I'm saved now. Thank you, Lord. I got it from here. <laughs> and what Paul is doing is, you foolish Galatians, how did, how did you get there? You didn't start in the flesh. But also, let, let me step back for a minute too, that how many of us, been Christians for a while, but we lack maybe the assurance of our salvation? We wonder, am I really saved? Is God mad at me today? Is He upset at me? Is He disappointed in me? To be disappointed, generally disappointment, if we're going to use logic, disappointment requires what? It's a good test here. Shock. Right? You really disappointed me. What do you mean? Well, I had higher expectations of you and you let me down. Well, God knows all things. Is it possible for him to be shocked? Can he be disappointed? I would say no. Because he can't be shocked. Do you follow my logic here? Right? Just work with me. My logic. Okay. In our human realm, you disappointed me because I expected more of you. Well, if God knows that what we're going to do, it's, he can't say, well, I expected more because I knew you were going to do that anyway. So I'm not shocked. God, fair enough. Logic is truly, you know... But when we see her, God goes, look. Here's the question. Here, the other one. 
Can God love you more five years from now than He did the moment you got saved? No. We don't get there by our works, right? Now God could say, hey, I'm displeased by the choice you made. That doesn't glorify me. Yeah, that's disobedient. Yeah, that's unrighteous. And you know what? I might discipline you for it because I discipline those whom I love. But I'm not going to love you any less. And what the Galatians were doing was say, this is awesome. I've saved by grace, but I'm going to use my works to keep God pleased with me. That doesn't work that way. God's grace holds us all along. And that's what his point was. But the thing here is what Paul says is God, Jesus died for our sins voluntarily, willingly. That's great love, right? Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, John 10, 18. I lay down my life myself out of love. Secondly, it comes to rescue. It says Jesus came to rescue us from the present evil age. And here we are. This is an evil age. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3, 1. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Tell me if this is, doesn't describe what we're going through. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Do we see that in our culture? Nothing is sacred at all. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. In other words, they'll call what is good hate or evil. They will betray their friends, be reckless. They will be puffed up with pride and they will love pleasure, a.k.a. entertainment, rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. We, what Paul begins to say here is, as a Christian, we come with the message of salvation, the gospel, the good news, that rescues us from this age. One of the verses that, in John 17, I won't quote it all, but... Jesus said, Father, I'm praying for all of them. Please do not take them out of the world. I go, why did he have to say that? <laughs> he left us here, not as orphans. So there, there's this dichotomy, that this, this par uh, paradox, if you want to say it, that here we are, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We live here in the midst of this perverse and crooked generation, Philippians 2.14, right? But yet, God, Jesus says, I'm with you. Father, do not take them out of the world, but protect them while they're in the world. Because our job is to be a witness. And we are rescued from this present age, this, this wicked generation. Romans 12 says this, I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. The goal for us, the, 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 uh, the proof, if you want to say that way, of the gospel is that we have been rescued from this present age and we're continually being transformed. We're not conformed to the way the, the world is. We think about all these things. Is, is money our, what we're after? Is material possessions what, we, what we're looking for? Are we looking for prestige or fame, riches or success? Are we putting all of our eggs in those baskets? Are we finding our identity in those things? If we are... Paul says, no, no, no. That's what the world goes after. Nothing wrong with success, but do we find our identity there? Or even religion. You think about the Pharisees, not all of them, obviously some were saved, but yet they took pride in how religious they were. And ultimately they took pride in their good works, which we are to do good works. 
Finally here, God wants us to never compromise or pollute the message of the cross. It's that Jesus died for us. When we think about, think about the world for a moment. What's the world's religion? What's, what's common to all of them? Self. Self. If I do enough good, it'll outweigh my bad, generally. And we're talking about religion. If you have those that are just don't care about God, whatever, they're just all about selfishness. But those who are religious will say, I, if I do enough good on my own, God will be pleased with me. And we go, well, that's not going to get you anywhere. Christianity is unique in saying there's nothing you can do that's good enough. And unless you claim perfection, that, I just, I like that. It just goes straight to the, it just pulls the rug out of anybody. Oh, so you think that you can receive God's favor. Do you realize that the Bible teaches that you have to be perfect to do that? What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, nobody qualifies. Man, you're getting it. You're getting it. You got it. Bingo. But, you know, here, here's... Do you, you find that when you evangelize and you share the good news? I mean, this, we have the good news, right? We don't have the good news. We have the best news. We're coming and we're saying, you're a sinner and you're worthy of absolute eternal hell. But, man, we have great news. God loves sinners. Man, he loves sinners. He died. Jesus came and died for sinners. And all you have to do is be willing to repent, turn, and follow after him and receive him by faith. Trust. And they go, well, but I want to do something. <laughs> That's important. Because what we want to say is we want to, we want to pull our pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, whatever, however the phrase goes. We want to come along and say, God is lucky to have me on his team. And this is where we go to number three. The authority of the gospel is rooted in God's motive. The motive was to protect God's glory against man-centered works. He says this in verse five, to whom, God the Father, be glory forever and ever. And then he has to stop and say amen. This is where I gave you a whole bunch of verses there. God says, no one will brag or boast in my presence. No one. If you're in my presence, it's because by my grace, I brought you here. Don't think that you're here because of anything in you. That the gospel, this is what Paul is after because in Galatian, they wanted to say, yeah, 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 we like faith. We like grace. That's fine. We're not against that. Paul's the one that's got it wrong. We just, we, we, God's grace, but you just need to do a few works to continue to keep God happy with you. Jesus, awesome, faith, grace, plus circumcision. And what we'll see as we continue to go through this is that here, here's what we'll leave for today. Is if you truly, truly have repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ in the gospel, then is it possible to, for God to disown us or for his love and his kindness towards us in grace that he's given us in salvation that he's taken us from death into life he's taken us from an unbeliever into a believer from a child of the devil into a child of God and we're in his family for him to say I disown you the gospel of God's grace is tremendous in that it gives us great freedom the book of Galatians is about freedom. It's about freedom of forgiveness. It's about freedom of going, yeah, I know I'm a screw-up. God knows that. Again, I'm not disappointing him or surprising him. 
God knows that I'm going to be on this journey and I'm going to go up and down in my, in my, my actions and my good works. I'm going to sin. I'm going to get forgiveness. I'm going to continue on my way. But God knows that. God looks at us and He says, I see you as who I have destined you to be. That's, that's why God doesn't just annihilate us. Okay, let's be honest. He looks at us and says, when I look at you, man, I just see Jesus. I see Jesus as righteous. Mother, when I look at you, yeah, you're a pathetic sinner still. I know that. But that I see you in your glorified state. You didn't get there. You didn't get here by your works. You got here by grace. And you're not going to get there by your works. You're going to get there by everything I've done by grace. And you qualify because you have Jesus' 100% perfect righteousness. God's outside of time, right? We live in this up and down. He looks and says, I just see glorified, Mondo. That's what allows me to tolerate you. <laughs> to tolerate your sin, your goof-ups, your stubbornness. I see that. And I know that I am going to 100% Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in me, what? Will complete it until the day of redemption. If you stand, we'll pray. Fathers, we come and we get in on this, this study of Galatians. It's so rich. It's interesting. The, probably the first letter that was written in the New Testament. But here we are. We're... we're You've called us to become warriors, peaceful warriors, for the battle of the gospel. We know that Peter said that salvation is found in no other name. Acts 4.12 And yet we know, Lord, I find it fascinating that here we come with this greatest news ever and yet it's hated because it, it's, it strikes against man's pride. We want to boast in ourselves. We want, to, we want to take ownership of our own destiny. But yet you will not allow any of us to boast in your presence. You deserve all of the glory. That's why Paul would say this too. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We love you, Lord, that you have rescued us from this present age. And there's still struggle. Again, we still go up and down. But we know that it's by grace we've been saved. It's by grace we'll be sanctified. It's by grace that we're going to get to the end. I pray, Lord, that you would grant us that assurance of salvation, the glory of the gospel. We love you, Lord, because you loved us first, and that's an awesome thing. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I've been listening to his sermon since I was a little girl, but I always... Hearing the gospel like that over again, it's just awesome, isn't it? <laughs> it just gets you all excited, and we're going to sing this last song, It Is Well With My Soul, and I can't think of a better song to sing when we hear the message, Jesus plus nothing. We don't have to do anything. It's just Him. So as we sing this last song, I encourage you guys to just sing this out to Him, that it is well with my soul, because... It's all you. It's all him. It's not us. Let's sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll What
with us today and we'll see you next week.